YouTube. Hello, welcome again to Philosophy Roulette number 223. I had a request by the chat to do some uh, animal language, animal mind talk. So here we are on Phil Paper. The section is Animal Minds, and we're going to give a gander at what's available. So what do we got here? Let's see. Anything not super long. Enigmas of reason. What is human reason? How to rise? How to connect to animal reason? Let's just open it up. It looks like fun. Although Journal of Consciousness Studies is very scientific sometimes. It's not great to read. Um, Uncle Rhesus animal. Auntie Psychoderm. All sorts of stuff. How dogs perceive humans and how humans should treat their pet dogs. Frontiers in Psychology. Click on that. Hmm. This is a review. The dog one looks interesting. I'll click. I'll click on the dog one in a sec. Let's go see what else is like right here. I'm trying to find myself uh, something of reasonable length. Problems for predictive information. All right. So we're talking about theories of biological communication. I'll just click on that because that's not super long. Uh, metacognition. Let's keep going real quick. If I could talk to animals, measuring subjective animal welfare. Click on that. Oh, it's a dissertation. That's going to be massively long. What is good for an octopus? Animal sentience. Dimensions of animal consciousness. Okay, so that's got lots of things to click on. Enigmas of reason. Is it available? No. Let's click on here. Let's see. Hey, you know Heather Browning. Cool. That's neat. How dogs perceive... Aha, it's here. 17 pages. Ugh, teeny words, double spaced. It's 34 pages, double... Oh, no. All right, so we can take a look at this, but it would take over two hours to read. All right, you're keen on the dog one. All right, so we've got the dog one here. How dogs perceive humans and how humans should know. <laughs> yeah, well... If I read fast, it'll be, yeah, we can go through it fast, maybe. All right, predictive information is popular, promising information based theories of biological communication. Nope, that's just like science -y. If we could talk to, so here's Heather Browning, LSE. Here's the paper. Let's see how long it is. Paper, this is a paper speedrun pa uh, show, actually. I am only speedrunning. Oh, this is her, uh, um... This was the dissertation, and I like how she has the, uh, like, basically the Jurassic Park, um, font, almost. But yeah, I'm not reading her 200 page plus, um, dissertation on stream. What is good for an octopus? Oh, so this is also a Heather Browning. The, this whole, like, philosophy roulette is a, uh, oh, so look at this, this is a comment, we could read... Hey, if you want to read this by Heather Browning, it's two pages long. And then we've got Dimensions of Animal Consciousness by more people from the LSC. Uh, Trends in Cognitive Science. Let's see if it's available. We'll go back to the dog in a second. The dog paper. Which one? Which one is that? Let's do that one. Uh, the octopus one's good. Well, it's two pages. I'm always going to read the two-page one. Uh, open access, so it's here. Download PDF. Dogs be important. All right, so this is 13 pages on here about this uh, dimensions of animal cognitive. So, all right, we can look at that in a sec. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to look at, oh, dearie. Okay. Um... Let's take a look at this real quick. All right, so we get a vote here. We want to do octopus, or we want to do dogs, or we want to just do the octopus first and then see if I can handle it. <laughs> I told you this is a potato computer. <laughs> Alright, so we got this one, this one. Uh, not. <laughs> no. I, 
I'm going to put a new computer together. I've been saying this for like six months. No, it just, uh, it slowed down for a second. I mean, the, the bit rate's okay. It's just, uh, yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is, well, we've got what is good for an octopus real fast. So we're going to do a, uh, do this quick. And then, uh, we can get to the dogs afterwards, okay? Let me, uh, download this actually. Cool. So, okay, what is good for an Optimus commentary on Mather for Octopus Mind? Heather Browning. I think she's at LSE now. Okay. Empirical evidence now appears to be in favor of Octopus sentience. Okay, so we've got octopuses are conscious. Their ability to experience subjective mental states. The Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness states the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. Okay. I mean, but I can, like, I don't know who these people are, but I mean, I can declare whatever I want to. Mather lends further weight to this conclusion, bringing together the current research on the cognitive abilities of octopuses to argue pa why can't we call them octopi? That'd be so much more fun. To argue that they possess a mind. Rather than this, Mather goes some way towards exploring what this mind may contain. This is of primary interest when we when considering the welfare of octopuses. If octopuses are sentient, then they have a welfare that can be harmed or benefited. Even if this is the case that octopuses possess multiple minds rather than a single unified consciousness, insofar as these are multiple loci of felt experience, they are still each capable of welfare as for men, any members of a community of sentient organisms. When keeping captive octopuses, knowing what conditions will positively or negatively impact welfare is crucial for ensuring their quality of life. Understanding the minds of an octopus will be essential in the development of evidence-based standards for care. There are currently few documents detailing husbandry standards for, for cephalopods, and we should expect these to grow and change in the future as we learn more about what octopuses think and feel. Okay, so this is just outlining, basically, we should treat them better because they feel it. Okay. As Mather argues, the umwelt, or perceptual world, if you guys don't know this thing, there's a book called like Umwelt and uh, it's actually kind of interesting it's a short book I think you can get it online it's like it talks about like the world of a tick like what does the world look like a tick so the world that you perceive so it's like a sort of like your small world is that's what's meant by Umwelt of the octopus is likely to be vastly different from our own. They do not perceive color, but rather the plane of polarization of light. They exist within an aquatic environment that allows for sensitivity to chemical and mechanical cues we are not able to perceive. This means that when considering their welfare, these environmental conditions must be included. <laughs> Currently, recommendations for octopus husbandry refer to lighting, brightness, and appropriate day-night cycles, but have not considered light polarization. Lights which appear gentle to the human eye may not be so within the octopus perceptual range, so light polarization should also be measured and taken into account. Chemicals within the tank can affect health, but, also, <clears throat> but may also be pleasant or aversive in ways we do not usually consider. Chemosensory enrichment opportunities could open up new avenues of exploration. Vibrations through the water can have a large impact on octopus health and welfare, with noise and vibration control forming a core part of the guidelines for octopus husbandry. Octopuses probably can play video games on the other hand. Yeah, I think that's uh, the whole purpose of the paper. I don't really think it should even be controversial unless she's reading too much into consciousness or make some contentious assumption in the full mind conscious podcast. I don't know what it's going it, Yeah, it's a commentary paper. That doesn't mean she's not going to say something in the next paragraph. Because, I mean, this may just be like, look, we have to be paying more attention to this, which it seems like it might be. Because, um, I mean, like, that's it for it, the paper. But let's just get through it, see what, what else she has to say. Because, I mean, 
even just bringing in this concept here is like a fun enough for a two-page paper. If you're thinking about how to deal with non-human intelligence, you might have to consider that they see the world differently from us. I mean, there's the classic uh, Predator movie where the Predator, of course, is seeing uh, heat signatures um, and not uh, like colors, but they see heat signature. But you never know when you're getting into this. That's why it's roulette. Just guess and you find out. Mather also describes two of the primary needs motivating octopus behavior. Well, you have to also ask where it gets published. Um, this was not in a philosophy journal. This was in like some sort of other journal. Um, this was in Animal Sentience Journal. So, I don't know what they publish. Maybe they do stuff like this on it. Um... So, I mean, this is just a comment and that's okay. Mather also describes two of the primary needs motivating octopus behavior, exploration and fear. These are very likely to impact octopus welfare and should accordingly form an important part of octopus husbandry. She provides evidence that octopuses have strong motivation to explore beyond simple potential for extrinsic food reward. Provision of novel environments and objects for octopuses to explore is hence likely to be central to octopus welfare to prevent boredom and frustration. The guidelines for cephalopod care recommend complex and en complex enriched environments. This evidence gives us reason to give this particular recommendation a high priority. Mather also shows that octopuses lacking the protective shell of their mollusk relatives probably feel vulnerable. Indeed, they are most often found near suitable shelter. It will almost certainly be crucial for octopuses' welfare to provide sufficient refuge, such as opaque tank walls and shelter to provide feelings of safety and allow the opportunity to retreat. Finally, personality differences between different octopuses give us reason to consider their needs not just as members of a species, but as individuals as well. These concerns are particularly relevant against the background of recent debate on whether octopuses should be farmed for consumption with the desire for cheaper and more easily obtainable octopus meat, conflicting with environmental and welfare concerns. Although there are currently few such farms, mostly in the trial stage, it is likely that their numbers will rise in the near future. Within this context, it is important now to is now important that we know not just that octopuses think, but also what they think. A better understanding of octopus welfare needs needs could be used to provide a stronger case against their farming if their needs cannot be met. Failing that, it also can also help to ensure higher welfare standards if such farms do inevitably arise. The recognition of octopus sentience has led to legislation and regulation for their protection within laboratory settings. It makes sense that similar Regulations should also be in place for the use of octopuses in farming based on what we know about octopus welfare. Welfare standards thus developed can also be applied to other captive octopuses housed in laboratories and aquariums. The mind of an octopus may be highly different from our own, but it is only by trying to see the world from their point of view that we will be able to find out what is good for them and hence ensure their welfare. Okay, so basically this is like a little bit of maybe public philosophy, just keeping the keeping the sort of the concepts of what's going on in with animal minds focused on how it interacts with uh, welfare and how we, we're supposed to do stuff. So it's like, what are you doing? Well, this is a commentary to say, look, these are the important concepts and this is how it matters ethically when we're dealing with these animals. It's like, okay, so cool. I mean... Nothing too, too crazy, but, like, you got a few ph philosophical concepts embedded in there, and you know what? Like, that's fine. Fine for now. And she has a fun owl shirt. Okie dokie. So now we're going to move on to doggos, which I don't know if I'm going to be able to, like, last. Because I'm like, <laughs> it's harder than it looks to read and review online. <laughs> but we will try. We're going to go fast on this one. So, um, yeah, exposition, mm-hmm, so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys are, like, a few seconds behind now, uh, let's see, close this, open, um, this is Ben.
Oh yeah, if you wanna... Ludwig Poggies? So there's the uh, link to the, the dog paper if you guys are interested in this. Let me just write this one down. Ludwig Huber. Yeah. Oh, dearie. All right. Don't want their name to get cut off. Hmm. Nope. Oh, wait. There. Yeah. What are you gonna do? I'd have to. I'd have to change the zoom. <laughs> oh well, whatever. So, we we're gonna go fast with this one. It doesn't matter. Academia is just a game. Yeah. Well, that's part of it too. You have to publish to get a a job and keep your job and then get tenure and then all that stuff. And that's why I don't care because I'm not an academic. <laughs> I don't have to worry about what I say or anything. Okay, so we're gonna go quick because this is seventeen single uh, double columned. So uh, you all ready for this introduction? The question of how dogs perceive us humans is important for several reasons, both from the perspective of biologists as well as animal ethicists. First, an enduring topic of animal behavior and animal cognition research is how animals adapt to their social environment, how they cope with the cha challenges of dynamic relationships among group members, and especially how they achieve a balance between competition and cooperation. Complex social life has been proposed as one of the main driving forces in the evolution of higher cognitive abilities in the humans and non-animals. Complex social life, this means nothing. See, we were talking earlier about weasel words. What is complex social life? We have no idea. So, but why would that be a driving force? Or did something else do it and then did complex social life happen afterwards? No idea what that means. Secondly, while evolution has equipped species with the appropriate cognitive tools to engage in sophisticated social interactions during foraging and conflict management, including the formation of valuable relationships, social bonds, it is less clear how species became able to deal with heterospecifics with whom they live in close interaction that is not simply as prey or predator. This is the case in at least two domains in urban species and in domesticated species. In the latter domain, dogs have been considered as a species that form the closest bond with humans. So how is it how is was it possible for these animals to engage in such close interactions with humans who are members of a different species with a different anatomy physiology including different sensory modalities behavior and cognition while the first two reasons might inspire cognitive biologists who address topics in animal behavior and evolution to investigate dogs' perspectives on human-dog relationship, animal ethicists might find additional reasons why the question of how dogs perceive humans is important. This is because the relationship between dogs, human and dogs is characterized by a clear dominance hierarchy, not only during the process of domestication, but also during the individual life of the dog. This only gives us an ethical reason why to consider the human-dog relationship, but also a reason why to consider it differently than human relationships that are not characterized in such a way. Humans have domesticated dogs, not vice versa. I don't know about that. Maybe they really wanted to be taken care of, mainly to exploit them for their own benefit, as assistance during hunting, as guarding of their homes, or as companions. I mean, that's the old thing for, uh, that's the theory of cats. They say cats live with us not because we like cats, but because the cats want uh, to be fed. More recently, we've added other tasks and purposes that cover a very wide range of different contexts. We use dogs as testing devices in labs, as search and rescue animals when looking for missing persons, as much as when looking for rare truffles. As therapists in animal-assisted therapies, dance partners in dog dancing, hair models in dog grooming, or influencers in social media, just to name a few. The multitude of interactions and contexts in which we use them, of course, has produced a number of welfare issues and, as we are going to argue, ethical issues beyond welfare. While ethical debates have convincingly pointed to human responsibility 
responsibilities, for example, in the case of farm animals and lab animals, companion animals are often not so clearly seen as animals which we use, objectify, or instrumentalize, maybe because the term companion indicates to some degree a mutual relationship rather than an exploitative one. But how, in fact, do dogs experience this relationship? How do they perceive the humans they engage with? Have they indeed specifically adapted to interact and form special bonds with humans that as domestication hypothesis, as the domestication hypothesis suggests. We assume that part of the answer to these questions can be found in the growing evidence for dog special skills to perceive and understand us. The structure of this paper is as follows. In a first step, we will discuss insights from the dog's domestication history and from how empirical studies on their social cognition to end on so empirical studies on their cognition illustrate how dogs perceive us and consequently sketch the nature of the, our relationship with them. In a second step, we will assess whether ethical responsibilities arise from the characteristics of the human-dog relationship. Should we profoundly reevaluate some ways we how we use dogs and enrich the narrative of dogs as companions and man's best friends with some ethical considerations that are indeed more demanding? Our methodology thus utilizes the relationship result from current debates in dog social cognition to evaluate the human-dog relationship from a critical ethical perspective. Our aim is to show by means of such an interdisciplinary investigation in what ways our current knowledge about dog domestication and dog social cognition can and should inform our treatment of these animals. For our discussion of the empirical evidence, we have picked three areas of dog social cognition where we find sub Substantial amount of studies. Our selection thus mirrors the general interest of the research community. However, the community might be neglecting other possible abilities in dogs due to a lack of interest in them, a publication bias towards positive results, flawed study designs, or other reasons. We will come back to this in our ethical discussion, since what we do not know about dogs might be relevant to the treatment that we owe them. While in this paper we will restrict our discussion of ethical implications to the kinds of studies available or more profound ethical implications might lie ahead once cognition research broadens its focus. <sighs> this is what I mean. This is why I limit, like, this is one page. This is the introduction. I didn't even get through the whole page and that, this was a huge mouthful. Um, what I think I want to do is let's, like, make some guesses about what's going to happen here. I mean, the first initial thing is how the hell can we start to say what uh, how a dog perceives us when we can barely get straight on how we see each other we can barely even do this for humans this is one of like the great things like we've been arguing about what it means for my pain your pain do you have pain do i have pain how do we even like describe pain like scale one to ten what the heck does a three pain mean versus a ten pain i don't know and because some people are just whiny and so everything's like their life is over. So it's like, how do we actually um, do this sort of thing? Because the idea that like we can put ourselves in some other organism, what it's like to be a bat, does that even make sense? Um, and these are like big questions, so I just don't know. And so how do, yeah, how do dogs see humans? I don't know. I mean, how do we see humans? Okay, so let's give a, let's skim over this. I mean, characterizing the human-dog relationship. So, okay, they're going to go over. <laughs> well, I'm happy you're happy. I mean, it's just that going through this, I mean, it it would, like I said, it would take two hours to even do a good, uh, oh, thank you for this. I appreciate it. Um, like, if you want to uh, suggest other things, you can always send me messages. And uh, you can get notifications uh, if you, what's it called? If I can type anymore. Um, you can get notifications if you, of course, uh, follow here, subcri subscribe or whatever. And you can also check the Discord um, to uh, get notifications there. Send me messages and whatnot. So let me... So yeah, what do I want to do with this? Because there's no way I can read this and without dying, basically. Um, just like failing to be able to maintain this. We'll be going into like Super Bowl. If you guys are in the US, happy Super Bowl day. Superb owl day. Okay, so here's a question. Effects of domestication, new skills or, or special sensitivity. I have to think that there has to be some sort of massive bias in how we understand domestication. Um, like, what have we actually done and why would we think that our understanding of domestication is, it like, even remotely objective? 
<sighs> yeah, so we've got dogs have been changed possibly significantly over the last 30,000 years. No one knows exactly how it happened. Um, and that's like, how did it happen to their uh, cognitive and communicative adaptations? No idea again. Since time, since the time dogs became a special focus of ethology, part of cognition, so-called domestication hypothesis has dominated. I don't know what this is. So let's read that. It has been assumed that dogs have been selected to cooperate and communicate with humans during domestication, and thus evolved from genetic predisposition, allowing them to develop skills shared with humans. Accordingly, it has been suggested that, in a unique way, domestication has equipped dogs with two abilities necessary for cooperation cooperative problem sol solving, namely social tolerance and social attentiveness, which enable them to adjust their behavior to that of the human partners. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. Shared skills with humans. Why don't we think... What do we think is special about sharing skills with humans? And I mean, they say, of course, right here, which ones are the uh, important ones? Namely, social tolerance and social attentiveness. Um, famously, if you point at a cat or point, a cat will look at your finger, dogs will look where you're pointing. So in some sense, there's something like an idea of pointing between both dogs and humans. And so we have a skill, pointing, and we both understand this. Um, oh, I bet you could train a cat to look where you're pointing. Uh, so genetic disposition I find this very like very strange what exactly is genetic what is like incul inculturated you think that's plausible and I'm not sure social tolerance or attentiveness were among those features they didn't previously have them see this is the thing why do we think this is special like is it more that we think these things are special and that's what we like and that's what we're realizing in dogs or did we some or did dogs somehow gain that and uh, that is something. And, like, how did they gain it? I'm not even sure. It may even be more social with the dogs. Like, that is just how it works. And it's not even social tolerance or attentiveness. That may have been in there to begin with. It's just our concept of social um, might be different. Um, for, for It might just be different for us, other animals. And so it's like, well, what may not have been developed at all. It may have just been for whatever reason that the social level between us and dogs are similar and maybe even like certain birds have like like social interactions like this i don't know people seem to get along with their birds just fine too so i don't know but like this is an interesting hypothesis that this is what domestication has done and i don't know if i like buy it at all but like this is what people look at so this is what the uh, experts think is important so okay uh, and they looked at dogs and wolves. See, this this is exactly the problem. They're going to look at the closest relatives that's not domesticated. The problem is, of course, that sort of assumes that domestication happened the way we thought it did and all the things kind of going into it, which we don't know. And so it's like, why are wolves actually the best thing to compare it to? I don't know if they are, but it might be. Okay, so, but they did look at the evidence, blah, blah, blah. Apart from social tolerance, cooperation with humans and learning from humans are facilitated by a high degree of social attentiveness. All right, so they put up with us, and then they're attentive to us. But I mean, we're attentive to them. Did we not get trained on them? I don't know. Let's just see. All right, so these are attentive to partners, attentive towards other things, humans, attentive towards a bunch of stuff. Um, okay, so differences between dogs and wolves. You see, young dogs follow human pointing better and look at humans more readily than human-raised wolves. Yeah, so the dogs are better than wolves at the stuff we expect the dogs to be better than wolves at. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Let's see. So these... My back is dying. That's why I keep leaning. Excuse me, people. However, as most of the studies compared the animals' interactions only with humans, it remains unclear whether the differences between dogs and wolves reflect mere differences in the readiness of dogs and wolves to interact with humans or more fundamental differences regarding intraspecific cooperation. Yeah, this is a good point. And this is what I was trying to say, and the authors are on top of their game. So, so who knows exactly what the underlying issue is between dogs and wolves or is it just us favoring the um 
one over the other or something like that. Okay. So we got this canine cooperation hypothesis. Let's see. What is that? The canine cooperation hypothesis postulates that dog-human cooperation evolved on the basis of wolf-wolf cooperation and that no additional selection for social attentiveness and tolerance was necessary to allow for dog-human cooperation to evolve. Okay, so then we've got like a wolf uh, interpersonal uh, development is really what primed human dog uh, development. Okay, so rather than tolerance, domestication may have led to reduce, reduced fear of humans. Yeah, so I mean, if it's just that's all it was. And then we are being more introduced into dog society than dogs are being introduced to our society. Okay. Uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so these are good ways, like different ways to look at this. Individual development. Despite being equipped by evolution with skills and propensities to adapt to humans by showing high levels of social tolerance and attentiveness, dogs need individu to individually learn much about their heterospecific partners in order to establish and maintain firm individualized friendships. During their life in the human household as pets or companions, they have ample opportunities to do so. Family dogs live in close day-to-day -day contact with humans and can therefore collect an enormous amount of experience. What experience? What is dog experience? You guys know what dog experience is? Like, I don't know what that is. Research from the last decade decades has sought to understand how dogs perceive elements in their environment, learn about it, and use this knowledge to make informed decisions about proper behavior. Their skills in face their skills in face processing, behavior reading, observational learning, and perspective taking play a crucial role here. And what follows, we summarize the sum we will summarize recent findings on dogs' understanding of human emotions, gestures, and actions. This is always a, a fraught topic. How do we are we recognizing the actual emotion, or are we recognizing a ser a series of empirical sort of like? Um, properties that we're somehow putting together and deciding to do something about that. Is it the actual emotion or is it like, oh, the person has a frowny face on and they're crying and therefore I should do something because frowny faces and crying means bad. But like, I don't actually recognize the emotion. I'm just re recognizing like sort of a, a limit, uh, I mean, a list of uh, properties that require action. Okay. How dogs read our faces and listen to our voices. Let's see. Chemo signals. Blah, blah, blah. Dogs can quickly find out what features are relevant or informative for making important decisions. Huh. They also spontaneously focus on the eyes to infer where humans ad attend, what, what they are interested in, and even what they intend to do next. I mean, that could also hold for other dogs, too, for that matter. Gaze following. Yeah, present in many species, but dogs outperform even non-human primates in following human gaze in object choice tasks. Interesting. Okay, so dogs do this well. Uh, okay, so they... So when, depending on what the person is looking at, the dogs pay attention. When being watched by the caregiver, dogs stayed laying down most often or for the longest time. But when it, the caregiver read a book, watched TV, turned her back on them, or left the room, their patience ceased. Obviously, they were using eye contact and eye orientation as cues. So I guess the dogs will just sit if they're being looked at because they know that like they're like in some sense interacting with the person, and that is like a sit down time. But if the person some somehow starts doing something and is not paying attention to them, they no longer have that engagement. So that's interesting. Uh, human faces provide much more information than simply looking patterns. A great number of idiosyncrasies f feature allow humans to identify and recognize others. There's a reason Twitch got popular and you have to have a face cam. And like face reveals are so big because it gives... We're very, very, very well trained to look at people's faces and like gain information. And so this is kind of part of the thing. When I started this series, it was like I could read this without a face cam. I could just like, you know, not have like like you could see all this. Like just this box wouldn't be here. It would be all that that stuff. But I kind of wanted it so that you could see there's an actual human reading these things, not just like off in space. So But yeah, okay, let's see. Anything else? Could they also identify and recognize their caregivers and other humans? 
uh, basis of some, let's say could, so what would what is even being asked here only a minority of dogs could finally identify the caregiver or face on face pictures on which the outer parts of the face were occluded with a balaclava hood. A further study confirmed the importance of hu- human eyes for dogs because they rely less on the nose or the mouth than on the hu- eyes for human face discrimination. They also prefer looking at upright over inverted faces exactly as w- we ourselves do. So that's interesting. So the dogs are also focusing on human eyes as the most important part of the human face okay it's good to know but again there's nothing that says that this is specific to us like we might be looking like we like looking at other people's eyes but why do dogs like looking at our eyes i mean it's likely for similar reasons but i can't you can't say that it is exactly that the same reason why dogs and our and we like looking in other people's eyes Okay, on the basis of findings, dogs are competent enough to extract subtle idiosyncratic features of a face in order to identify a human person. Blah, okay, that's nice. Well, yeah, it does not, nothing here, I don't think is going to be too revelatory. I think they're laying the ground for the extent at which dogs, um, what dogs are looking at, and then so, and sort of how dogs perceive humans. Like, this is sort of like, they're going through the whole thing of like all the specific things we know about how dogs, um, what they're looking at and what they pay attention to. Okay, blah, blah, blah. These findings provide strong um, evidence that dogs are able to discriminate between emotional expressions in a different species, which compared to emotion recognition in con conspecifics is particularly challenging. <clears throat> All right, why do they think we can know um, emotional expression? Uh, let's see. Given the simple discriminatory cues in one half of the face, such as teeth in the lower half, were absent in the other half, the authors could test the dog's ability to spontaneously categorize novel pictures on the sole basis of emotional expression, provided globally and not just by local cues. Indeed, the dogs not only managed to learn the training test, but were able to transfer the extracted rules to novel faces. So, okay, so what they did here was they went like this, and they showed, like, an angry mouth, or then they switched it up, or, like, angry eyes, and then they were able to, like, the dogs were able to put that together to, to match up angry people. Okay, but again, do we know if they're recognizing emotion, or if we're recognizing a series of, of general facial cues? Because people are kind of regular in how we uh, do stuff. Interesting, though. The ability of dogs to integrate information of humans across modalities has also been investigated by using expectancy violation procedure. Okay, so whatever. We can do it in different settings. Understanding human gestures. How dogs learn to cooperate. I don't think... How do you learn to cooperate? Like, I don't mean, like, cooperate well, because people can be trained to cooperate well. But how do we actually know how to, like, get work with other people? Like, wouldn't you have to have some sort of theory that other people are being useful? I don't know. Due to domestication programs, I had the goal of producing companions that work or with or for humans, and thereby following human commands, dogs may have acquired a special sensitivity to human gestures, speech, and behavior. Neither the chimpanzee, human's close, closest living relative, nor the wolf dog's closest living relative can understand and use human communicative cues as flexibly as the domestic dog. Okay, this is just f- stuff, stuff. One of the best examples of dog's sociocognitive skills is their ability to properly respond to human cues in a cooperative search context. Numerous studies have shown that dogs can reliably follow a set of basic human cues, uh, just approximate pointing, head turns, and eye glances, as well as being adept at flexing, general, uh, flexibly generalizing this behavior to relatively novel human movements, cross-pointing, leg-pointing gestures. So if, like, I guess I point with my elbow or something. Um, yeah, Okay. The best study one is human pointing gesture. First of all, pointing by humans is a social cue, which in general is more salient or effective than non-social cues like visual markers in terms of signaling location of something important like food. Uh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so far no consensus about among researchers about when exactly dogs become competent at understanding the pointing gesture. So we don't know what does it. But I mean, we can do it. The dogs can look at what we point. And it's sort of an interesting thing that they are the ones that do it best. 
dogs future future use of human cues is highly malleable depending on reinforcement history okay so that's interesting are is it because they are trained to do one thing or because like this is how we do stuff and so maybe they're looking not at the finger point but at how we react to finger pointing i don't know okay uh subtlety in the uh in the cues how subtle can we get Actually, no. It's the first two letters of my first name and the first le- two, three letters of my last name. That's what it is. <laughs> my poor brother he didn't realize philosophy majors are good at standardized tests. He was a physics major, and he bet me that he would outdo uh, me on the GRE. He lost that bet. Yeah, if you're on a desktop Twitch and you go on like the about. Like, I have a website. It says my name right on it. I'm not worried about people knowing my actual name or, like, the general air. I'm in New York, so it's like, go find me in New York. Good luck. So, yeah. <coughs> and to tell you the truth, my name has caused untold amount of annoyance on Twitch because I, I, lo- I mean, the, I signed up years ago. I mean, I don't know why. Many years ago. And now it gets flagged by the, uh, bad word generator just because of the n blank g like blank r sort of pattern so i wonder if dogs would be able to instantly recognize like baseball cues like they do with pointing um i suspect that they could definitely be dude did you not see bat uh basketball what was that uh the the movie with the dog playing basketball man like seriously blah 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 i thought you liked movies um i'm pretty sure Uh, yeah, but exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I bet they, uh, I bet dogs, well, the, there's the question of they understand the pointing, but do they understand like the idea of a baseball game? is that's a much, much, much more complicated thing because that's like a whole sort of like system game. Very like, hell, people don't understand baseball. Like lots of people don't understand baseball or basketball or all these things. So like what do, what is the extent of uh, animal knowledge when it comes to like systems of like human activity? Like there was a story of a police horse that, they were chasing some guy. The guy got away. The next day, the horse stopped in, like, middle of traffic, and, like, the cop was feeling bad. And it's like, why is the cop, like, the horse stopping in traffic and blocking all the cars? And then the cop looks down and realizes the guy they were chasing the other day was in the car, and then they arrested him. So it's like, did the horse understand the concept of, like, this is a guy we have to catch? And that's very different from just, like, okay, understanding, like, a pointing action, like, go over there go over there or do they understand that like we are doing some more complicated thing so what would a baseball cue be i don't know would they understand would they be able to pick up on them yes would they understand the meaning of some sort of like cue that exists only in like the minds of humans like a baseball game because it's a completely artificial sort of thing like there's no sort of uh baseball for dogs but Maybe they could. Like, I don't know. Dogs are sophisticated things, and, like, games are... Everyone plays games. So perhaps they would be able to really get more into it. Okay. Yeah, so... Here we go. We're getting now to the uh, nitty-gritty problems. Mechanistic versus... A completely mechanistic or mentalistic account. Are they just following the directions mechanically or do they have some sort of concept of what's going on we got middle ground here of humans having visual uh perspectives that are different from their own blah 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 all right so brower et al confronted dogs with the situation in which they were forbidden to take a piece of food dogs stole significantly more food if they could be seen by the human even only the through a hole they stole more when they could only be seen, seen by the human, even only through a hole in the wall, showing that, to some extent, dogs seem to be sensitive to the human's visual perspective. 
But is this sensitivity simply a result of associative learning to respond to direct cues, or can dogs infer from indirect cues what humans can or cannot see? The result of two recent studies indicates the second possibility. Okay, and the classic, the now my now favorite example is that squirrels will hide their nuts, will fake hide their nuts, if they think another squirrel is looking at them. So if like a squirrel sees another squirrel and is going to hide its nuts, it will fake hide its nuts, and it will pretend to hide its nuts, and then go hide it somewhere else. And it will, again, fake hide its nuts if it thinks it's being watched by another squirrel. It will do this five times, up to five times, and then it gets sick of it, and then they bury, and then they actually do just bury the the nuts. But like the squirrel will fake hide their nuts five times if they think a squirrel's watching, and they only do it with other squirrels. They, if people are watching, they don't care. The squirrels are just like whatever. You're not, you don't count. But if other squirrels are watching the squirrels, then they care. So, I think squirrels have a theory of squirrel minds. Okay, so what is this uh, study here? Let's take a look. Two recent studies indicate a second possibility, and food-stealing tasks seem to understand that when the human food is illuminated, the human can see them, and therefore they refrain from approaching and stealing the food. <laughs> Genius squirrel, yeah, the sixth. Has the yeah, the 20% smarter the sixth time. In the second study, dogs showed that they can understand something about a human's perspective because out of two humans informing of where food was hidden, they relied on the one who could see the food hiding process. So if they could see the people and they knew the person didn't have a visual like line of sight, then they knew the uh, person, they would take the word of the person over that they knew had line of sight. Interesting. Okay. Oh, very recently we replicated the second study, but added the condition in which no directly observable cues could tell the dog who would be the knower and thus reliable informant. Okay, so they didn't have line of, they didn't, the dog didn't know who had line of sight. The critical control for behavior reading as the less demanding alternative to mind reading, so they're reading behavior, like who's more confident maybe, involved two informants that showed identical looking behavior during the food hiding event. However, due to their different positions in the room, only one had the opportunity to see where the food was hidden by a third person. Using geometrical gaze following, dogs could infer who could possibly see the food hiding and whom to trust. Okay, so this one actually was on the site. The other one was like they just, I guess, the person was out of the room. Interesting. Yeah, geometrical gaze following, despite being seen to rest on a cognitively sophisticated mechanism, does not require mind reading. The recognition of mental states like beliefs, desires, and intentions. No, you just need to be able to like sort of place things in space. You don't need to have other um, mind reading things like beliefs. So dogs confident in the format was in the position who, to see the relevant event food hiding might be a product of generalization from similar situations in everyday life. I mean, you got to think certain dogs are going to be able, like if they're hunting in a pack, one dog is going to have a better visual line of sight on something than another one. And that might actually just be something that they've had forever, like understanding line of sight. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they can learn stuff. Yeah, they can learn stuff. Okay. Yeah, see, page seven. <laughs> Not even on halfway through page seven. Understanding human actions, how dogs learn our social game. Dogs have impressive capacities for social learning. This competence shines through in almost all forms of social learning. Blah, blah, blah. All sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff. Only recently, it has been shown that dogs engage in what has been termed over-imitation, the copying of unnecessary or causally irrelevant actions. This pe this peculiar form of copying was, until that time, considered a uniquely human capacity, which likely played a key role in why human culture can accumulate over time. It has been assumed that humans over-imitate not only for cognitive and normative reasons, but also to satisfy social motivations. Okay, blah blah blah. All right, so they did some, the causal action consisted in opening a sliding door that blocked access to a treat. The irrelevant action involved touching colored dots that were mounted on the wall at a distance. So they were fake pushing buttons, basically. Touching the paper sheet had no effect and was not necessary for getting the treat. Despite its irrelevant, almost half the dogs replicated the touching action. Did they not know that it was irrelevant? And they must not. Have, they must have known. Um, 
And the question is like, maybe it's like statistical, you know, maybe they think we're doing it because it statistically matters and statistical things are kind of harder to do. Like you do it sometimes because it keeps up the food going. Like maybe it's some sort of background action. So it might not be like completely irrelevant or it's not clear what counts as completely irrelevant. All right, so great apes don't do it. Uh, but yeah, again, maybe this is just some sort of statistical understanding that dogs have, like a probabilistic, like you, you, you it, it doesn't actually matter that you go and you touch the button. Um, like I go push a button, push the button, push the button, push the button. But like that doesn't actually do anything. But for all you know, it's like a ritual. Like it, it's like a rain dance, not a rain dance. Um, it's like it's uh, praying for like the regularity of the rain and something. It may not actually be a causal structure, but like this is something that you think might maintain like the structure of the universe. Um, so like you have to keep up doing the stuff, the ritual to keep the regularity of your world going. Uh, okay. <coughs> In a follow-up study, we tested the hypothesis that dogs are more inclined to copy irrelevant actions if shown by the affiliated caregiver rather than an unfamiliar person. So, yeah, I would be unsurprised. They, they do more along the lines of what people they like. Uh... Accumulating evidence suggests that the relationship between companion dogs and their human caregivers bears a remarkable, remarkable resemblance to the parent-infant attachment bond. Okay. I mean, I'm not surprised that, like, we're all sort of similar in that. For instance, dogs pay more attention to the actions of their caregivers than to the actions of other familiar humans. Yeah, because that's, in some sense, more an important relationship. So, like, human-parent-infant bond. Eh. Don't know why you can really read into that. All right, taken together, these findings show that dogs pay close attention not only to their emotions and gestures of humans, but also to their actions. They even over-imitate, thus showing a specific copying style that is believed to be a crucial feature of cumulative human culture. I have no idea why over-imitation would be considered that, but okay. Blah, all right, whatever. Moral emotions from biology to philosophy. Here we go. Ugh. Uh, I don't know if I can handle this anymore, guys. I'm, I'm like dying, like halfway through this. Uh, okay, I only have to get up to here. 13. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. <laughs> Dogs are deeply entrenched in interacting with humans for which they are equipped and with outstanding skills to understand human emotions and gestures and actions. They form cooperative teams with us and they engage with us as communicative partners and they have been enculturated in our society and clearly are part of so whatever that's nice empathy can be understood by following the walls of russian doll models as an umbrella term that covers all those ways in which one can be affected by others emotions the capacity of emotion contagion lies at its core and the outer layers of this Russian doll can incorporate more cognitively demanding capacities such as theory of mind, perspective taking, and sympathetic concerns. Okay, so we've got a layered view of like emotions here. Uh, because empathy could motivate moral behavior like helping philosophers of animal minds and animal ethicists discuss it as a moral emotion that animals could possess. Uh, I mean, do we really understand empathy even in humans? I'm not even sure. Anywho, let's see. What else we got here? There's, there is, to our knowledge, not a single paper that provides strong empirical evidence of dogs feeling guilty. I have seen a cat look embarrassed multiple times. And if they can look embarrassed, I bet they can feel guilty. There is my... Oh, I don't have a link to it. Why do I not have a link to this? There is the most important cat video on the face of the earth. Basically... I, ha I link it somewhat regularly because it's this cat like stalking a bird and all these people are like look at the cat stalking the bird like it's in the foreign language I don't know what they're exactly saying but they're clearly hiding like keeping back to like let the cat go after the bird it's a pigeon and the cat's like sneaking up and the cat's like you know doing it's, sorry it's doing it's little thing sneaking up on the bird and the bird like looks back sees the cat it's like just standing there blah 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 and then the cat gets a little closer a little closer and the bird just takes off 
and the cat flops. Just like, ugh, dagnabbit. And, you know, all the people start laughing their butt off because it was so completely obvious in the disappointment that the cat had. And the cat's like, what, wait, what, you people are watching me? Like, looks at, and it looks at the people and sort of gets up sheepishly and walks away. But, I mean, like, how... The cat, like, un- like we understood what was going on with the cat. The cat understood, like, what happened when we were laughing at it. It's like, yeah, most important cat video ever. Anyway, all right, let's see. So there's, but there's moral motivations. But, like, that, the, the, the point is that there's empathy there, that everyone understood what was going on. <sighs> let's see. Owners indeed often interpret their be- dog's behavior as guilt, something... That can be ethically problematic. Failure to read read these gestures for what they are, or even worse, misinterpreting gestures of appeasement as a sign of the dog's feeling guilty, are likely to lead to inappropriate responses on the part of the human in the situation, and hence lead to escalation of the behavior, resulting in lunging, snapping, or biting. Yeah, so we don't know if the dogs ever feel bad, which is kind of interesting. Interest in the name to Billy's animals is rising among philosophers. Okay, that's nice that we like these things. All right, so we don't know. We have to close the gap between theoretical and empirical evidence. The emotions of guilt and jealousy face similar similar definitional problems that will surface more and more when research into them proceeds. So we just don't know about the ethical standing, I guess. Uh, let's see. In any case, our point in the following section is that we already face good reason to arrive at a more profound ethical consideration of dogs than we often grant them. We will settle with the kind of ethical implications that we can derive safely by focusing on the kind of research results summarized in sections. these sections. We believe that the mentioned capacity suffice to argue that dogs have a profound understanding of human gestures, actions, and emotions. They clearly bond with us and enter into relationships of mutual understanding and meaningful interaction. Such relationships have repeatedly been described as characterized by attachment and close bonds. Let us build an ethical argument on that. So you know what the funny is like, okay, so they did this whole argument and then we they just agree with what everyone already thought. Okay. I mean, is it unsurprising? Nah. But, like, yeah. It's like, still. It's like, if you just end up with... If you end up at the end where you already thought you were going to be, it always is like, well, all right, that's nice, but, like, I'm not sure what progress has been made then. I mean, basically, they've outlined it very much. They, they've done a... I'm sure they did a better job than I'm giving them credit for, like, going over all the points, but still. All right. Let's see if we can just get to the end of this. Characterizing the human-dog relationship ethical perspectives. Until now, we have very much emphasized a positive outlook on the human-dog relationship. It would be a one-eyed view if we would only mention the obvious positive aspects. For any ethical discussion concerning pet dogs, we need to understand that on top of the affiliate, affiliative motive, the behavior of these animals vis-a-vis their caregiver is also determined by their dependency on us and thus on educational and normative influences that need to be examined carefully. Okay, so what are the dogs getting out of this then? So, yeah, blah, blah, blah. In what follows, we will engage in a brief ethical discussion of the human-dog relationship. As a necessary first step, we will characterize the human-dog relationship as one in which there is a necessary power imbalance. Blah, blah, blah. See, again, now we're getting into power talk here, which is interesting. Um, Where one of the partners is always more powerful than the other. I mean... What are we to understand of power, and what do the dogs understand of power? Things like that is kind of, it's very difficult, um, because that's getting more complicated even for people, you know? The human-dog relationship as a power relation. I mean, it's like, are we going to get a straight-up, like, Marxist reading of human-dog relationship? I don't know. Because, yeah, enslaved, moral dilemma, enslaved. Uh, is it a political theory here? I don't know. Forms of labor? I mean, this is exactly where, uh, yeah, personal freedom, forms of labor, sheep herding. Most importantly, it is questionable whether dogs given in any form their free and informed consent to fulfill the task we assigned to them. Yeah, there's no consent with dogs, really. All these things. 
thereby it seems possible and even morally desirable to grant an animal choice, more choices and thus more freedoms. How would you give a dog a choice about this stuff? Because I don't know if they'd even recognize choice. Like, uh, I mean, you've got a like kibble and you've got like, uh, like kibble A and kibble B. I mean, okay, they can eat whichever. But it's like, what's an, how would they understand the concept of uh, like long-term like choice in, over the course of their lives? Like, what does that even mean? Like, how would they have free choice? Like, do we have free choice? Like, eh. Okay, whatever. Liberty would be unpleasant. <laughs> Lack of control or liberty would be unpleasant or where animal would use, usefully learn the process of choice making. Yeah, I mean, how do you learn the process of choice making? So I can pro approach ultimately aims to reduce the power hierarchy and set up situations that empower animals to make their own choices. You don't give kids choices. Like, kids are idiots. They are. That's why you like they don't have any like they don't have any like legal rights for a long time because kids tend to be idiots. Like why would you give a dog a choice? Like even if you've got a really smart dog, it does not know what's going on like in the human world, like outside of like their little space. So I, I am not sure what the range of stuff is here. Okay. Up to now, a high amount of paternalism and training involved in the human-dog relationship gives rise to a clear power relation. Yeah, sure. All right. So they're going to try to like cut away, like chip away at this. Establish your position as a pack leader by asking your dog to work. Take him on a walk before you feed him. And just as you do not give affection unless your dog is in a calm, submissive state, do not give food until your dog acts calm and submissive. Yeah, so it's like training. Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer. <laughs> I was not expecting Cesar Milan in Philosophy Roulette, but okay, there we go. We come across a substantial reinterpretation of affection as something that is not given to the dog unless the dog is in a calm, submissive state. Training, procedure, and other substantial <coughs> reinterpretation of feeding the dog in the sense that meals become a sort of jackpot in classical modern reinforcement training. These narratives are normal, normatively relevant because they show the tight entanglement of power, predetermination, and submission in dog training expressed by language in which dogs work for us. No matter the method, all training ultimately educates the dog into a human world with the aim that they function properly, that is, according to the value and disvalued behavior in the setting. They are not supposed to chew on our furniture, pee on our carpet, or chase the neighbor's cat. Spaces where a dog can, for example, run free without a muzzle or a leash and interact with other dogs are clearly restricted, as well as rare in at least in urban settings where a number of dogs have been increased, increasing dramatically over the past decade. Yeah, so... But it's the same thing with, like, kids. You have to, like, train kids not to be, like, little maniacs. You put them through school. Okay. Yeah, so we were aware this understanding draws a rather sobering picture of the often romanticized human-dog relationship. However, pet keeping is not a given or simply a result of natural affinity between humans and dogs, humans and animals. It's a historically contingent practice that has also been circumscribed by social class and gender constructs. I was wondering if that was going to come into it. This is a soci sociological point that links with ethical and biological perspectives, like all our relationships with with companion animals, the human-dog relationship depends on how we define animals, and that our knowledge about their abilities, and needs, seem and needs seems crucial. For sure, it is also crucial how ready we are to take their perspective into consideration. For this question, the power and hierarchy are relevant. Yeah, so it's like all these things, like our understanding of what we're doing, even at the moment, is like rather sophisticated, and so it's like. Even then, what does like the dog's perspective in our rather complicated view of things, like why would that even line up? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so, but again, human dominated power, but this is definitely our viewpoint. I don't know if the human dominated power relation is really how dogs see it. I mean, they might, but or is that more a uh, human projection onto the dogs? Because that is how we see things in terms of power relations. Yeah. <sighs> don't know okay so in addition we need to deepen our understanding of the kind of relation we offer them and the power relations characterizing it yeah how do we deal with power relations um
the characteristics of the human-dog relationship point to a propensity towards trust on behalf of the dog and consequently entail a duty not to betray that trust. Eh. Yeah. The duties of dog caregivers. In animal ethics, there's a generalized agreement that humans have negative duties towards, or at least some animals. Negative duties re- refer to duties not just to... Not to cause unjustified harm, a position that can be defended from a number of ethical theories, including utilitarianism, deontology, and virtue ethics. However, negative duties do not exhaust all that morality demands from us. In human-human relationships, we are also often required to assist someone in need, even if we are not responsible for their harm. For instance, for example, if we witness someone fall onto the train tracks at an underground station, we are morally required to do our best to save them, even though our their peril is not our own fault. Uh, those are positive duties, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so we have to provide dogs with food and care. <sighs> yeah, well, this is treating dogs like kids. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. I don't know. We are responsible for our dogs' lives from beginning to end. Not always, but a lot of times. But what does it mean for life to be good? So now we have to ask what a dog's life is to be good. Then we've got desire satisfaction stuff. Okay, so have a desirable life, be satisfied in your life. Alright, whatever. Now we're just getting into straight up ethics talk. I mean, (laughs) surely a life in which a dog is overall happy is a good life for a dog. So could we have a hedonistic dog theory? That'd be fun. Imagine a dog not called Fido. We've got Frida now. Here we go. Imagine a dog we'll call her Frida, whose caregiver decides to keep her inside the house her whole life to protect her from possible dangers and fearful stimuli she might encounter outside. Frida is provided with an adequate diet, a comfortable bed in which she can rest, and enough toys to keep her entertained. The extremely controlled environment she is kept in ensures that she is very rarely experiences any accidents or illness or stress or pain. If we look at Frida's life as a whole, we will see that she is extremely pampered to say that, in Irvine's words, overall happy, but is it a good life? Yeah, this is the old, uh... I mean, it's just like... These sort of, like, weird sort of dystopias where everything's cared for, but, like, you don't have, like, any choice, really. I mean, this is just, okay. You know... This is interesting, like, we can just rerun all of the uh, normal ethical thought experiments, but now with the dog perspective that they kind of set up in the uh, paper above. I mean, the problem is we don't actually have good answers in the human case, which we kind of have been looking at for a lot longer. So how would we actually also then come up with a uh, dog case? I don't know. Dogs are eager, like uh, they are eager to cooperate with us. They are tuned to us like no spe- no other species. So placing your trust in them. Okay. So if you have a duty, let's see, what is this duty that we have? That, okay, so we have a duty to like not betray the trust. I think is what the conclusion is here. The trust that dogs place in us is no coincidence. Instead, it is a result of the process of domestication of which we are at least partly responsible as well as a result of what they learn in interactions with us during their lives. Humans thus have a duty to live up to this trust, to ensure that our dogs' needs are met and that they are not placed in a situation where it would be warranted for them to feel betrayed. Uh, Okay. To paraphrase Cook, humans have a duty to act in ways that, that make them worthy of the trust that dogs place in them. For this duty to exist, it is not necessary for the dogs to possess a cognitively complex form of trust for which we do not have any empirical evidence yet. Our argument is that the way dogs engage with us evidences a trusting relationship that gives rise to duties on our side, not on theirs. For the kind of trust we are after, we do not need the dog as a moral agent to fully understand what trust is in a normative sense, nor do we need the dog to understand duties on her side. Dogs' capacity to enter into such relationships with us is independent of the question of whether they have, in addition, the sort of capacity for full-blown moral judgment that orthodox frameworks of moral agency requires, even in, or even a simple, explicit motivation to trust their owner, which could make them a moral subject in Roland's sense. At least the former intellectually demands 
demanding forms of trust might be tied to other complex abilities such as theory of mind. Our point is humbler here, but still of profound relevance. The kind of trust we identify in the human-dog relationship becomes an ethical signpost in light of the dog's dependency on her caretaker. Okay, so this is what happened. Since we have all these interactions with dogs, and they learn that we are, like, sort of in under... The, they they learn to be in our care then they place trust in us as far as they can and so as far as their trust is placed in us then we have to uh um then we have an ethical responsibility to them okay then we're just summarizing this yeah i don't know if you can tell but i'm like mentally just collapsing because i just can't handle this amount of words all at once <laughs> but i uh, thank you all for being here if you have any questions let me know um let me just read up this last two paragraphs of the conclusion here. Irvine 04 arrived at the conclusion that relationships between humans and animals have depended on how given a given society defines animals and what it means to associate with them. She argues that we concurrently know about, what we currently know about animals demands wrestling with the moral implications of keeping them as pets. We have follow, been following this critical view of pet keeping in general and dog keeping in specific because it could serve as a helpful heuristic to map out problems that are often overlooked, specifically problems that point beyond welfare towards other normative concepts. 16 years after Irvine's paper, we face a, a substantial amount of, how, of new research on results on dog social cognition, which we have summarized in this paper and which we need to take into account when debating human-dog relationship today. From what we have discussed, we gain a better understanding of a main characteristic of the human-dog relationship that lies in its dichotomy between special attachment as well as a special understanding on the one hand and the instrumentationalization of dogs on the other hand. Against this backdrop, a meaningful social interaction between dogs and caregivers remains a fragile construct. In order to treat dogs in the way that morality requires of us, it is paramount that we bear in mind the spectrum of positive duties that this relationship engenders, including the duty to live up to the trust that dogs place in us. Hooray! <laughs> all right. I do have to, like, go do other stuff today. Um, I thank you all for being here. This was a bit of fun, but it's just dense. These uh, papers like this are very dense, and so it's hard. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, happy uh, super superb owl day. And uh, I think when will I be back? Uh, I'm gonna try to stream again during the week. Um, so I'll try to be streaming a little bit more. I've just been busy. All right, have a good day, everyone, and stay safe out there. <laughs>